Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into upper back and rear delts. Alex, I don't want to trap you into anything, but what are we talking about today? That was amazing. Thank we you. are talking about all things upper back and rear delts. And that includes the traps, am I right? <laughs> it certainly does. But and um, you trapped me in it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So within the upper back, we're going to be talking about the rear delts, the rhomboids, the teres, and the traps, correct? Yes. It's awesome. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot to go into it, but let's first go ahead and dive into how we use them in our everyday activities because I think that is a lot easier to conceptualize, especially if you're listening and you're thinking, I don't want to grow huge traps, so I'm going to hit next on this episode. Really being able to learn how you use it to function can be helpful because it's not that we ever want to take all of the volume out. We just want to know how to use it within our training. Sure. So daily task, this one's probably going to be more common for the men listening to this episode when you are looking at your significant other and they ask you, hey, where is this thing? And you give the, I don't know, shrug, <laughs> your traps are going to be contributing to that one. So you may be throwing up the, uh, I don't know, shrug more often than not. <laughs> what other ways are you going to be using those upper back and rear delt muscles? Through a lot of things, it's it's something where you know carrying groceries, the traps are going to be a large stabilizer or contributing component to that. So anytime that you're carrying large objects, think of wheeling a, a wheelbarrow, for example. That one's going to be another option to where daily activities. If you're doing you know gardening or pulling things, um, the traps and things involved in the upper back are going to be contributing muscle groups. What about like starting your lawnmower? Starting your lawnmower, big one. You're you're getting in a stance generally staggered depending on how new or old your lawnmower is if it's an That's older true. one you may need to really get a lot of oomph into mm -hmm. that pull and you may be really using your traps and upper back to pull that um, for some of the newer ones it may not be as extravagant of a, a pull <laughs> i know one that i use those muscles every day is flipping pancakes oh flipping pancakes is another mm -hmm. one less, but still, you know, a little bit of the, the shoulder elevation mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. And then uh, looking up at the TV, that's another one for yeah. sure. Some people are saying you don't want to have the TV up anymore. You want to have it right at eye level, which seems ridiculous. Can you imagine if in our living room, the TV was just like right in front of us? Okay. So I have a bone to pick with that because I like visually where our TV is if you walk into the room. But when we are watching it, I kind of scoot down on the couch to like set my head back so I can look up at the TV because otherwise I hate just like looking up at the TV. You know what I hate is when I'm looking up at the TV and I catch myself mouth breathing <laughs> and I'm like looking up and my jaw is just dropped down and I'm like, close your mouth. You look ridiculous. Like I, I wish you would have gotten a picture of me. Actually, I don't wish you would have gotten a picture of me because it would have been very embarrassing. <laughs> well, I'll keep my phone close now uh, <laughs> to make sure that I get those in. So when it comes to the visual look of these muscles, how are we going to see that come to fruition? So from a visual perspective, one of my biggest things with a side profile, so the delts, the traps, these things are going to really benefit your anterior and posterior visual, but I'm going to focus on the side profile right now. And when you see someone from the side looking at their delts, if they have well-developed anterior and medial delt, but very much so lack their rear delts, it's going to look as though that they're a little hunched over, that they're not going to have the, the posture and shape that really aligns their arm and upper body to really have the best shape overall. So by having the rear delt, it just gives you more of a complete look to your delt. Mm -hmm. I love the look of just all parts of a delt as a whole. It's a really, really good look. And now looking at you, one thing I I see is just how your trap development really helps with how your t-shirt is sitting and being able to fill out that t-shirt. Yeah, nothing looks worse from a male perspective 
this is me talking about me as well as I see other men in, in t-shirts and I'm like, that's not a good look, mm -hmm. um, is when it goes from their shoulder and you see like their, uh, their clavicle protruding out and then it's just a straight line to their neck, mm -hmm. a little bit of a bump. You don't have to have traps up to your ears. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be this hellacious thing where you can't even turn your neck, <laughs> but a little bit of shape is going to help how your shirt fits. Yeah. That's going to be a big one there. And uh, just being able to also look good in tank tops, not just, and that's going to also be able to be those rear delts showing in the tank top, really being able to show that full, like truly full look, that fullness to your upper back. Yeah. And it's just going to give a, a visual representation of, of shrinking your waist as well. Like when you're looking at whether it be male or female, us having a stronger, more muscularly dense upper back and delts is going to make our waist appear smaller. And I just love like within for women of being able to have like that shape to your back of, I feel like it really helps of like, yes, we talk within lats of showing like that tapered look, really letting your waist look smaller. But I feel like that's something I get compliments on when I wear things, whether it's like a halter top or a tank top on just how my upper back looks because my lower back isn't showing super duper often, if at all, but my upper back shows a lot. And that's something I love of just being able to see that definition and shape from a tank top, halter top perspective. As I have many women come to me for their weddings, as, as mm -hmm. do you, as we do within all of physique development, one of the things that is almost across the board is that they're gonna have an open back to their wedding dress. And they want to feel very confident in how their upper back looks. They want their arms to look more toned. They want their back to carry more muscle density. And I, I think that when people talk about traps and just upper back development, they think huge muscles for some yeah. reason. It's never just the the delicate toned look that so many people actually want that they're thinking that they need to train that muscle to achieve that look. They just think that that's going to come more naturally, where in all actuality, the people that you are you admire for how their back looks in a wedding dress or in a sports bra or anything of that nature, they're training their upper back to some degree. Again, it's not that you're gonna put on this hellacious amount of muscle tissue, but it is going to be important if that's what you're seeking, which I would say within my sample size is almost 100% of the future brides that I work with. Yeah, and I think that a lot of times people just generalize traps to being your upper trap, and they're not even thinking about the different parts of your trap that are gonna contribute to your overall look and how much they help within stabilizing for movements where they just think traps, I'm just doing a bunch of shrugs and that's the only movement to do. And I'm going to have these massive traps coming out of my, like my neck, but it is so much more to that. And there's so much benefit to being able to have your traps there to stabilize. And again, what look it makes like people will comment on things in my upper back and they don't even realize that they're talking about parts of my traps of like, oh, I really like how that looks. And I'm like, yes, because I train those parts of my back. Yeah. I just think it's one of those muscle groups. I know we're talking about multiple, but one of those things that really complements a great physique. And if you're able to strengthen that tissue, I think it really just improves everybody's look. And posture. It's going to help with course. posture too. Yeah. <laughs> so diving into where these muscles originate and just to be able to learn a little bit more about them, uh, what do you want to start off with? So I've spent a lot of time on this and I think that it's going to be helpful for us to consolidate through action of what muscle groups and then we can kind of dig into each of the muscle groups specifically because there is more muscle groups, if you can believe this, <laughs> that are going to be involved in the upper back. We are going to spend time today on four of what I would consider to be the major contributors to the actions that the upper back would be performing through exercise and just through general movement. So <clears throat> we're going to have muscle groups that are going to connect the upper arm to our scapula. And then we're going to have muscle groups that connect the scapula 
to the spine. And so all of this is going to work in unison to allow for us to pull things closer to us, also being a contributing factor to pushing things away from us because that posterior tissue is going to be a contributing factor to stabilization as we go through a bench press, for example, but are also going to be contributing when we're doing a dumbbell row or a cable pull down or a cable row. And so we want to understand how all of these work in unison. And so the muscle groups that are going to be connecting the upper arm to the scapula are going to be the rear delt and then also the major and minor teres. And then we have connecting the spine to the scapula being the rhomboids and all three divisions of the traps. Now with those connecting points, does that mean that those muscles do similar things because they're connecting in similar fashions? Somewhat. Uh, I, I think that it would be an over simplification for me to say 100% yes, mm -hmm. but to varying degrees, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it'll be helpful once we get into the functions of the specific muscle groups to really walk us through this. So let's get started with the rear delts. Mm -hmm. So the rear delts have a handful of functions. I would put this into three different functions themselves. The first one is going to be laterally rotating the upper arm. And to put this simply, if we were to rest our palm on the outer thigh, if you were to churn your thumb counterclockwise, that is going to be laterally rotating the upper arm. Now, us in a sitting position, that's not going to inherently do it. In standing <laughs> and laterally rotating that hand, the entire upper arm is going to laterally rotate. The next is transverse abduction of the upper arm. Let's simplify this. If you were to be very irritated with your boss, and you were to say, you know what? I'm going to backhand slap this mofo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take my arm across my body and my palm is going to be facing me. I'm gonna rear back and rotate my body to really get as much oomph into this and make sure that my boss understands that I am not happy with how he's treating me. And I'm going to swing my arm as hard as I can, smoke that dude in the face. I don't know why I'm, you know, it could be a female. I imagine it's probably a male. Anyway, we're going to hit him in the face and I'm going to swing my arm so hard that it's going to end up behind my body. My rear delt is going to be dictating that entire action. And that is how you would transversely ab abduct your upper arm. <laughs> I thought it was a great example. I think it is. <laughs> it's a great visual. And I'm sure there's many of you who are like, I'm going to do this to my boss <laughs> and get fired tomorrow. Okay. Um, and then we have shoulder extension and hyperextension. Now, this is going to be the one where <laughs> I have another really funny example here. Oh my gosh. If you were to be standing in line with your significant other, and the only reason I use this as an example is that I've experienced this with my wonderful <laughs> significant other. <gasps> we'll be standing in line somewhere and I'll be whispering in her ear, intentionally annoying her. This is something that I like to do in my he pastime. He loves to do. And it's I like time. to be annoying from time to time. And for us to get into extension of the upper arm or hyperextension of the upper arm, a good example is that if I was to be standing behind Sue, annoying her, and she wants me to stop, she may want to take the back of her hand and sack tap me. <laughs> that may be a way that she goes about it. For her to do so, that would be hyperextension of her upper arm. <laughs> Learning so much about the actions that I use on a regular basis. These are amazing examples. I mean, I also backhand slap my boss <laughs> often. So this all works for me. Amazing, honestly. So those are the three main functions that the rear delt is going to be contributing to. We can talk briefly about the origin and the insertion, but remember that we have the, the cheat sheet that is going to be provided in the show notes, mm -hmm. that you guys will be able to have a visual representation of this, which I think will be even more helpful. So the origin of the rear delt is going to be on the spine of the scapula, and then it is going to insert on the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. It's going to insert on the upper arm. Yes. <laughs> In layman's terms. <laughs> Do you have any questions on the rear delts? I think that you gave some very great visuals there, some very great explanations as a whole. And I think that being able to see the actual visual in the cheat sheet will help close that loop as a whole. Um, and especially as we get into different exercises and how to train that. So let's go ahead and go into the traps. Perfect. Okay. So actually, before we get into traps, I want to stay on the muscles that are pulling the upper arm 
to the scapula. Okay. And so let's go ahead and cover the teres. So with the teres, we have a major and a minor. And for the super nerds out there like myself, the one interesting thing to me is that the major is actually going to insert on the front portion of the upper arm, and then the minor actually inserts on the uh, back of the upper arm, which I find to be interesting, mm -hmm. just to be pulling in different ways and how many muscles are really pulling on our different limbs to do these actions. It's fascinating to Wait, me. Wait, also tell the super nerds what the app is that you like using, oh, because I think people would really enjoy that. So a lot of the prep work that I do uh, for these episodes, I use an app called 3D for Medical. Um, they have... I mean, it's, it's honestly, if you were to look at my screen time, my email is huge. <laughs> using Google drive is huge. And then potentially number three is using 3d Four medical. Cause they have, um, lots of lessons on there. They have incredible models for you to look at when it comes to bone structures, muscle structure, uh, everything. And mm -hmm. it's very interactive. It's all 3d. You can do so many different things and showcasing the different actions that the muscles can do. I can go on and on. I'm <laughs> their biggest fan, not sponsored. It'd be super cool. If you guys would like to sponsor the podcast, you sponsor this episode. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> sponsored our podcast. You guys are amazing. Um, and so, yeah, it's a great, it's a great app. Mm -hmm. Anyway, with the two uh, portions of the teres, we have the minor, which the minor is going to laterally rotate at the shoulder and plays a part in the muscle complex that helps horizontally adduct the shoulder towards the midline of the back. I don't have a great example for this because it's such a small muscle group, but I thought we would at least talk about it. And I have a better example for the major uh, teres. So with the major teres, it is aiding in adduction of the shoulder and shoulder extension. So this would be utilized in, in uh, pull downs or rowing motions. And the easiest way to think about this is that if I was at the top part of a jumping jack, and I was to be bringing my arms back down, that's going to be the adduction and the teres is going to do a lot of that particular action. And this muscle is going to run right under the scapula. And so you'll see this in, in bodybuilders or individuals with more developed upper backs. It's kind of like this, um, it's, it's, a, it's like, a, like a tube almost. You could think of it as like a tube that runs under the scapula that's going to run into the armpit that kind of separates between the upper back and then where the lats would be visually uh, seen. I think sometimes people see someone with a developed teres and think that it's part of the lat because sure. of how it looks as a whole. Yeah. Um, but it was helpful for me to learn, okay, this is a different part of the back um, that's going in because the more that I did learn about anatomy and I did learn about how the muscles work, the better I was able to execute different movements because I just understood them better and knew what path I was trying to take because I knew where that muscle was, which especially with us talking about all these different muscles in the upper back, it is something that to be able to really bias each one, knowing these paths of motion that they work in is only going to help you be able to progress in whatever you want to do. Yeah. One of our biggest goals in providing this series is that if you are going into the gym and you understand these different components and you have a specific muscle group that you're wanting to train, no matter what the equipment is that you have available to you, you can get yourself set up and in a, you know, at least to the most minimal degree to accomplish whatever the target is. And so by understanding the insertion and the origin and how the function of the muscle group works, we can really go into any setting and put ourselves in a position where we can train that muscle group. Mm -hmm. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible for you. You should lift heavy. High reps, Carbs low are needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats needs. are great You for should squat astrograph. It's fine. It fits my macros. For idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one -on -one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need.
So now let's look at the muscle groups that are going to be taking the scapula and pulling it towards the spine. We'll start with the traps. This is the one that's going to be, I mean, it's a massive muscle group mm -hmm. and it's going to be very visually seen. Whereas with the rhomboids, these are going to run under the traps and you're not necessarily going to see them, but they play a very pivotal role in the functionality of your upper back. So when we look at the traps, we have three divisions. We have the upper portion, which is going to be also considered the descending portion of the traps. We have the mid or transverse, and then we have the lower or ascending portion of the, the traps. Now, the upper portion is going to be the largest contributor to elevation. And then this is also going to contribute to lateral flexion and extension of the cervical spine. So think about as you're pulling your head back to watch that TV or tilting your head to <laughs> miss the back, the backhand <laughs> slap that you almost got from your employee. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then the, the mid division is going to be the biggest contributor to retraction. And then the low, it, the lower is going to be the biggest contributor to depression, which all makes sense in terms of how it all lines up. Because if you look at the upper portion, those fibers are going to run kind of in this 45 degree angle up towards the neck and up towards the skull. And and so understanding that they're the biggest contributors to the elevation of the shoulders makes sense because of the fiber orientation that they're completing. And then the mid portion is going to be more horizontal and kind of towards that mid portion of your back between the scapula for you to retract better. It makes sense. Then looking at the lower in relation to the position of your scapula, it would make sense that they are the ones that are going to be helping with depression or pulling that scapula down. I think that that was wonderful to hear about the traps because like I already mentioned, I think that there's so much more to the traps than what people generally think about when they just think about that upper trap and seeing how much they help with the scapula movement and just being able to stabilize those movements as well is absolutely huge. I mean, it's going to be a massive contributor to so many of your exercises and, and for many listening, wanting to grow their lower body or grow their glutes for your movements such as the RDL or a deadlift or a trap bar deadlift, your traps are going to play a large role here and um, are going to be a big part to you staying strong through your upper body in those pulling motions. So uh, strengthening them is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. So how about the rhomboids? So with the rhomboids, these are going to be a little bit smaller for us and they're really just going to be a helpful hand in the overall retraction of the uh, scapula. So they're another bit like I say big because they are going to contribute in a big fashion, but they're not in looking at the muscle tissue going to be a big muscle, but important for us to uh, make note of. Mm -hmm. So they're just going to be helping with the retraction. Very simple. Well, we love to have simple here. Make sure that we're understanding it clearly. So what does it look like for go-to exercises for these movements? Let's go ahead and start back with rear delt, just so that we're going in the same order here, of what are some of those go-to exercises for you for rear delts? So for rear delts, I prefer to utilize the cable because I think that it's going to be the easiest for us to best bias the muscle group. We have to think in, in understanding how large the muscle groups are that are going to be around that muscle in the rear delt. And then those same muscle groups contributing to the same action that is being accomplished for the rear delts. So in a rowing variation, we have to be very intentional with our execution to try and better bias the rear delts themselves. And so one of the main cues that I provide is that if we're trying to better bias the rear delts, and we talked about all the functions earlier of, of how or what it's going to be contributing towards, we really need to have an intention of driving the upper arm out. Because if we initiate a rear delt biased row with retraction, we've got much larger muscle groups that we just mm -hmm. talked on that are going to be contributing to that retraction that the rear delts are going to be like, yo, bro, you've got way more strength and energy in these muscle groups that can do this. I don't need to contribute all that much. But if you were to start with the intention of driving the elbow out and driving out and not getting into retraction until the last moment, 
that's going to increase your chances of a better opportunity to target those rear delts. So doing that in a cable variation, I find to be a little bit easier relative to doing like a dumbbell rear delt biased row, for example, could be a little bit more challenging. And then you could do something like a, uh, a dumbbell rear delt fly. You could do it with a chest support or just doing it in a bent over fashion. Uh, but again, that, that moment arm. So when we talk about moment arm, it's going to be from the joint that is being targeted or working and then the distance from that to the weight that is being applied and so that moment arm is pretty large whereas if i was to be bending at the elbow and rowing that is basically cutting my moment arm potentially in half. I'm not saying it's a one for yeah. one, but it's going to be less of a moment arm than what I have for a rear delt fly. And so you may not be able to get to the same level of tension or load selection because of the length of the moment arm, but it's still a good movement. And you have to think about who is performing the exercise, like you said, of other muscle groups can take over. But like, for example, I have a client and she tr struggles with her upper traps being over involved with Within movements. And so it's something that we're really working on being able to bring like those lower traps in and those mid traps in to help, um, especially those lower traps to help with that depression and being able to help support moving down instead of her just feeling it straight up in her traps. If I give her a movement like the prone dumbbell rear delt fly, that's something where because she doesn't fully have the movement down and doesn't fully know how to engage the muscle that we want to work on, then her traps are just going to take over. So if you have a muscle group that you feel like takes over a lot, any way that you can be able to minimize the ability for that to take over, the better. And being able to move it to a cable fly was even better because she was able to be in a different position and she wasn't, even with the chest support, it just naturally of her wanting to shrug up and bring her arms this way. Whereas with the cable rear delt fly, she was in a better position to ensure that she wasn't shrugging up um, and we were able to cue in that. So I always like to really think about who I'm programming for and how they're going to get the most out of it because while some of these might target the muscle group the same way or the same amount, you have to think about how it's actually going to happen in, in practice with the person. Mm -hmm. There's a unilateral variant of the rear delt fly that I've been working on with the cable to try and bias the rear delts in more of a lengthened position. I don't know if I've necessarily found it quite yet. I, I feel like I'm getting closer and closer, but being able to target the rear delts in a more lengthened position is super challenging because of all the contributing muscle groups. Uh, but I think that it's possible with the cable. It's a in process TBD. TBD. <laughs> <laughs> I know outside of the cables, which I love a good cable movement, but I absolutely love doing rear delt rows on the hammer strength row, mostly because we just have it in the home gym and it's something that I don't have to set up. It's already there, ready to go, but it's also because it gives me more stabilization. Not only do I have a chest support, but because I'm in a place where the handles are fixed and then I'm in a fixed, more fixed position or I have more stabilization, I'm able to really focus on just driving those elbows out where if we take like a cable movement we have a few different attachments of we have like the um, four and one handle and then we also have the rotate handles on a short bar that the short bar gives it that there's so much more I need to stabilize whereas like the four and one already has more stabilization in it so I can feel those rear delts more instead of having some of those different muscle groups take into play um, but I just like how I don't have to set up anything for using the hammer strength throw? Uh, I prefer the, um, the short bar because I'm able to pull the handles more out. Mm -hmm. That's I would rather have the ability to pull the handles and have movement there rather than it being fixed and still trying to drive my elbows out. But I see where you're coming from too. Mm -hmm. All right. What's, uh, what's traps? What's your, what's your thoughts here? Well, of course, a good shrug uh, <laughs> always comes into play. That's where the mind goes first. Okay. Whether it's dumbbell or cable, I think that they're both good options. So do you feel like for, for client programming that you 
are programming a whole lot of upper trap work like that? Or No, okay. not for my clients. <laughs> I mean, I work, I definitely have worked with males before, but I work with predominantly females yeah. and not a lot of them are needing to grow their upper traps in that way. And like I mentioned, I have multiple clients that I have to really pay attention to their structure and what's going on because they have over-involvement of traps or they try to um, lock down their scapula way too much. So I have to really work work within the realms of how can they actually get output instead of just, oh, this is a good training program, where for them, it might junk them up more of making them feel really like stiff, really tight, um, and then end up making it so that they can't target the muscle groups that we need to. Um, so I do not find myself programming a ton of upper trap movements. I find myself mostly programming for lower trap development. Uh, with this being something that is often weak for many people, it's a little tough to directly target the tissue. I have two movements that I find to be really beneficial. I think one is from from Poliquin specifically, and I think the other may be more popularized by Casim. So the first one is going to be the, the trap three raise, and this is going to be done in a you know, prone position, and this is going to be much more, both of these movements, you do not need much weight. No, very little weights. <laughs> Don't get caught up in, I need to use all the weight in the world to make this a useful movement for me. It's a smaller overall range of motion, but it's going to be so beneficial to your overall functionality. And then it's going to better benefit some of your other movements. So the trap three raise, and then also the dumbbell Y raise, very similar movement patterns. Some feel more comfortable with the positioning of the trap three rays. Some feel more comfortable with the dumbbell Y rays. Both are going to be great movements in general, but I find those to be tremendously helpful for everybody, especially for those clients who sit at a desk a large part of their day or the clients who are constantly holding their baby on one arm or the other, like making sure that we're not dealing with any imbalances to um, the side that you're commonly holding your baby on and strengthening the upper back and, and utilizing unilateral work and things of that nature to be so helpful. Do you find yourself within the Y rays using a cable Y rays more or a dumbbell Y rays? So in the context of us trying to better target the lower trap, I will do it with them laying on a bench and then raising into that Y raise. If I'm going to be more specifically targeting the medial delt, for example, I'm going to use it more from a cable perspective. Is one right and the other wrong? No, but I find that with the goals that I'm trying to accomplish that this has been a more common situation for the clients that I work with. Mm -hmm. And how about something like a vertical pull down? How does that come into play within your traps? So for that, you're going to be having a little bit of really the mid and lower traps being the contributing factors. Because if we think about the way that these are, are uh, contributing to actions, that mid trap is going to be a large contributor to the retraction. And that's going to be a big part of doing the pull down. And then you're also going to have some level of depression of the of the scapula. So the lower trap is going to get some love there. You're not going to have a huge contribution to the upper trap because of the elevation, but I'm sure that there's going to be some stimulus to the upper trap, although it's not a contributing factor to the retraction that you're creating in that pull down. So are we looking for like a hard retraction as we go through that pull down? You're wanting to be smooth through the pull down. I think what many people run into is that before they even get into the pulling motion, they retract really hard before they even pull it, and then they pull it. And it's like, what What was the goal of the exercise? If we are are taking, like, think about this as we've going through the episode here. If we're taking the scapula and then the arm, and we're taking the scapula, pulling it tighter to the spine, but then we're keeping the arm as distant as possible, I, I mean it's going to, you're definitely going to be feeling something because it's mm -hmm. going to be feedback of like, yo, bro, we need that scapula to help us pull all of us towards the spine. And so if you're getting into that retracted position, you're certainly going to get sensation, but is it because you're having more muscular tension? I don't think so. Just from looking at it from a, a logical and understanding anatomy perspective. And so 
in that situation, we want to get to a hard retraction point at the end range of the exercise. But as we go through the eccentric and we allow that cable to move back up, we want to allow for our scapula to fan back out and open up as we get to the top. And we're going to have a, a, a slight degree of protraction of the shoulders and probably some degree of elevation to the shoulders. Then as we pull, we're going to see depression of the shoulders and then we're going to get into retraction as well. And then how about a horizontal row? How does that play in for your traps? So very very similarly, I would use a chest support here to allow for protraction to be in a great spot. And then we're going to allow for the lengthening of those traps to be in a good position. And then being able to, to row the dumbbells, cable, whatever the, the case may be. And then as you're continuing to pull back, you're going to get into that retracted position. Gotcha. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. So going into some of these other muscle groups we've talked about, what are your favorite exercises for Terry's? So Terry's is going to be pretty minimal. <laughs> we talked about the positioning for the jumping jacks. If we were to, to set ourselves up with a cable in that same position and then do the lowering portion of the jumping jack, that would be a way for us to load the, the Terry's specifically and get some pretty decent tension if we were to say that we were getting a you know, trying to bias the Terry's. Are the Terry's going to be helping in a lot of these exercises? Like, are you bringing the upper arm closer to your body? Yes. So the abduction of that upper arm is going to be transpiring. So they're going to be contributing in some manner. In the context of what we're speaking about right now, is there a way for us to better bias the Terry's specifically in exercise? This may be the main or only way to do that as best as possible. Mm -hmm. So how about the rhomboids? The rhomboids are going to be something where it, it's going to be running under the traps and then it's going to be contributing to retraction. So are we really going to have a specific movement that that is going to be the only contributing or biased muscle group in a any action of rowing or pulling down? I don't think so. I think that it kind of falls into when people talk about, oh, if you do a bunch of pressing, you don't need to do um, any type of anterior delt work. It, it not necessarily that that statement is true. Obviously, pressing is going to contribute to your anterior delt. So if you're a male who does a ton of pressing, you might not have to do as much direct anterior delt work. But it doesn't mean that, hey, that's completely a replacement for that. Or it doesn't mean that um, or like just in general, no muscle works in isolation. So even if we're trying to bias a muscle group, we're realizing that, yes, we might be biasing it, but it's not we're only working that muscle group. And so many of these contribute and stabilize and then are going to be able to benefit from the volume we're getting from these other muscle groups. Sure. And I, I don't know, you know, there may be people out there who are trying to I, I'm going to spend the next 12 weeks to solely grow my rhomboids and Terry's. <laughs> I just don't see that being a, a huge. I haven't heard that personally, but yeah. you, people could be out there. What are some of the more common training mistakes you see people make when trying to train their upper back and rear delts? I feel like momentum and initiation are huge ones. They kind of go somewhat hand in hand because you have to have an intention as you're initiating the movement. Um, and oftentimes with momentum, you momentum can be used positively, but 
oftentimes the type of momentum that I see is just kind of swinging the weight, getting it from point A to point B. So that's why I feel like they do go hand in hand. Um, but as we already talked about, of like if you just start with a retraction or um, like for the rear delts, if you're not really focusing on driving that elbow out, that you're not going to end up biasing that muscle group. So I feel like those are some of the top things that I see, especially for these muscle groups, because I feel like these are a little bit less understood or the movements are less understood. Um, those are the top ones. Okay. I, I think that with the momentum, when training your upper back, these are probably going to be some of the heaviest loads that you are utilizing when training any back. You think of lat pull downs, you're probably going to use more load in an upper back pull down than you're using in a, a lat pull down you know, specifically. And so you're going to have a greater potential of momentum. And especially in the world that we're in right now, where lengthened bias work is so prioritized that you can find yourself in a T-bar trying to do five plates on there when you can really only handle three. And then you're kind of like bouncing yourself throughout that entire motion, um, which is not going to be the best thing for you. So I think that control in any exercise is going to be important for us. And we have some varying arm angles that we can take mm -hmm. to try and better bias the rear delts or trying to better bias more of the upper back. And so with the upper back, we would be more, we would be at a, a wider position. You could say more of a T positioning with your upper arm. Whereas with the rear delt, we're going to be more at a 45 degree angle to better bias the, the rear delt specifically. And so the arm positioning is going to play a role in what you're wanting to accomplish. Now, this just needs to be reiterated. If you have your arms more in that T position, does that mean your rear delts are turned off? No, it just means that they are not having the most fibers contributing to that action. If I can get nerdy with you for just a little bit, there's going to be what we are starting to believe to be three different sections to the rear delt. And so if we look at this, there's going to be a section of the rear delt when the when we're more in that T position, that is certainly going to shorten. But then there's going to be a lower portion of that rear delt that's not going to be shortening and is going to actually create more length. And so understanding that by being at that 45 degree angle, this is the positioning that allows for all three of those divisions to get either lengthened or shortened. And that is the most optimal spot for us to be in. Not to say that these other elbow angles do not allow for us to target the rear delts, but understanding that we have three potential divisions of the rear delts is going to be something that is uh, helpful. Yeah. And I know Alex already mentioned the cheat sheet, but we also will have a YouTube playlist. So if you are wanting to have an explanation of how to set up these movements, how to really make sure that you're biasing them, we have videos on these movements so you can get those nailed down. Absolutely. What is another common training mistake that you see? We already kind of talked about it, but I would say the overstabilization of the scapula and just like retracting really hard to start the movement and trying to stay in that spot uh, throughout the entirety of the motion. So like you retract and then you just stay retracted and then you're having this much smaller range of motion with your arm um, is not going to be conducive to the growth that you want to see in that area. And it's going to be very painful. Yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's creating more impingements and issues mm -hmm. down the road that you're going to have to deal with and reverse um, over time. Like this is coming from experience. Yeah, I'm not coming from Both a place of, of like, hey, I'm I'm so smart. I haven't been doing this at a, ever. <laughs> like I was, I was one of those people. I did this for a while. You can go back to, um, I 27, 2016, 2017 probably, and you can watch videos of me doing that exact thing. There's actually a video out there, I'm sure, of me doing a dumbbell row with a straight arm. <laughs> There, I, I was, I was fixated on this understanding insertion origin. Okay. I'm trying to get these two points as close together as humanly possible. Well, the best way for me to do that is I'm just going to keep my arm straight. I'm not even going to bend my arm. Why? I have no idea. I don't even remember why that was what the thing was. And it felt great, but it was also, I was using you know, 30 pounds for a dumbbell row. Um, and that's just, you know, not the answer. Yeah. But sometimes you got to try all comes stuff from, yeah. and then you got to fail, so to speak, and you got to learn and then be able to apply what, what you learn. Yeah. I mean, whole. I'm sitting here 10 years into coaching, sharing the things that I've made mistakes on things that I've been successful with so that you don't have to. Exactly. 
Um, so I think that we have covered a lot of the common mistakes here that we see. I will say one other one would be the range of motion, um, but I feel like that widely comes from understanding the actual movement and knowing or even just the actual muscle to know what the range of motion, because a lot of times people think more is always more with range of motion of if I get more, is more not always more, <laughs> it is not always more. So would you say more is not better? You're saying? Yeah. Okay. I was just saying more <laughs> is more. I think more is more. No, no. Because more range of motion doesn't oh. mean more tension or more growth. I think it would still be more is better. Okay. Well, whatever <laughs> way you want to put it, it's the fact that more range of motion doesn't always mean that it is better or you're going to get more tension or more growth on the muscle. And I see that a ton, especially with something like an upper back pull down of somebody just going to the top and then going to a place that they have major protraction and then they will get into major retraction and then pull back down just because they're trying to get all this tension and all this range of motion as they go through it. So what are some of the execution cues that you would give to someone to maximize the potential of growth here? I think that being able to, especially within these movements that we're talking about within the whole upper back, is being able to have really good stabilization within your core and your torso is going to be absolutely huge. I think it's something where anything back related, talking about lats, anything like that, really being able to engage your core properly and get that in the best spot is only going to help you with these movements. And I can feel a night and day difference if I sit there and I do, let's say, an upper back pull down without engaging my core versus engaging my core, how much different the movement is. So I think that is huge of really being able to engage your core to stabilize yourself throughout the movement. I would kind of just strengthen that point of stability being, if you can find a upper back motion or just back rowing um, machine or setup that you're able to have a chest support in place, the better off that you're going to be. Like these are movements that require a lot of stability and a lot of output to really train the tissue to the point that you're seeing growth. And so the more stability that we can provide through having that core stability and then potentially having something to brace against, the better off that you're going to be. Yeah. And I think that also goes in line with just the setup as a whole of being able to put your in a position that not only you have that stabilization from a chest support or whatever it may be, but also that the angle is going to be lined up to hit that intended muscle group. Yep. I think that that really covers the, the main tidbits. This is one of those things that, um, you know, if people think that they're training their back, they can sometimes get massive rear delts because they're not actually training their lats. And so you may come by these muscle groups almost organically by just doing back days poorly. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that come to me that have great rear delts and great upper back, and then they have zero lats and they're like, and they come, we go through a lot of the exercises and they realize like, oh my gosh, I've been doing this wrong for 15 years. This is why your upper back and delts look crazy and you have zero lats because we just haven't been doing the motions properly. So you may be one of those people <laughs> <laughs> who has these very well-developed upper back and rear delts because of your poor back training. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you would tell someone when they're training their upper back, something to keep in mind, something you find yourself to saying to clients often or to yourself when you're training? Personal experience. I think that uh, trap training is the worst, especially the upper division, because if you are sore through the upper traps, that's going to extend up through your neck. And I find that a lot of tension headaches are created this way. So mm -hmm. if you are someone who's trying to grow your traps and you're like, man, my traps are sore. And I also have this like very subtle headache. It's just kind of par for the par course and being able to uh, stay well hydrated, all those different things is going to help, but you're just going to have kind of this little subtle headache probably the day after, which is very annoying. And I would just say that I know we've kind of already mentioned it, but I do want to drive it home with rear delt, really thinking out with your elbow is going to be absolutely huge with being able to bias it. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining and we'll catch you in the next one.